Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and father, partake fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard a voice behind me with a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys of death and Hades. Therefore, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars and the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So let's talk about that. Why is that not whistling? Talking to the teapot, Pastor Steve. Start laughing. Okay. What's this? Is it talking back? Mark on the counter, I'll start laughing. Yeah. For a second. All right, so Jesus, first off, tells us something very important about how to read this book. And that's like, that's numbers mean things and stuff's written in code, which we talked about a little bit last week. Mm-hmm. Okay, so obviously this is to be taken symbolically a lot of the time. So that's something to keep in mind. So going back to verse 7, so behold, he is coming with the clouds. I just went over in confirmation today. We talked about the ascension account and so, you know, why the angel said, why are you staring up into the clouds? You know, Jesus, whom you've seen depart from me will return in the same way. Like, where do you know he's going to return in a cloud? Because it says in Revelation, behold, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him talking about his second coming. Uh, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So that will be uh, those who pierced him is, I mean, yeah, that is the people that crucified him, but is that what he's actually talking about there? I'm not sure, actually. Uh, I would say it's more figurative as to be, you know, anybody who opposes is opposed to him. So all the unbelievers is what that's talking about. And of course, every eye will see him, but the people that didn't believe until they see him are too late. They are in trouble. All the tribes of the earth, uh, so it is to be. I'm the first and the last. First letter, last letter of the Greek alphabet. The one who is and who was and who is to come, he is eternal. He is outside of time and space. Okay, so now John starts going, okay, who am I? I, John, your brother and fellow partaker. The reason he doesn't give us any more information about what which John we're talking about, which it's John the Apostle, uh, although some people are, debate that, but he doesn't say which John he is because everybody knows which John it is when he wrote it. When he starts writing these letters, they're going to understand, yeah, that's John There's a John the Elder that's mentioned, but that's not St. John the Apostle, uh, because it was a common name back then, too. Uh, But he is a brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation. That word tribulation will become important. Partaker in the tribulation of the kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus. So that is the whole, like Paul writes in his epistles, you know, 
be perseverant, continue running the race, you know, because those that finish the race attain the prize. Um, so it's basically talking about, I am part of the tribulation, I am part of the church, and the church is suffering, uh, which is a lot of what this book is going to be about. All right, he's on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So he is in prison for being a preacher because the church is still illegal. And he's a public figure, so he's preaching publicly, and they threw him in jail for it. And by jail, they said, you're going to Patmos, which was a penal colony. It's like a mining colony. Where was that located? That is off the west coast of Greece. And that is... It's all the way on the left, down on towards mm -hmm. the bottom. It is actually right here. And it's off. It's actually off the map a little oh, bit, okay. but it's right there. Uh, so that, like, yeah, you can actually you'll see the name. It says Papas, but okay, the actual yeah. island is a little further off the page. Yeah. Okay, so that's off the west coast of Smyrna. Papas. Oh, I didn't see that because all the others are darker. Okay. Okay. So he is in, in jail for being a pastor. Shaming him. All right. You know, you get to keep that. Oh, thank you. And it says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So what's that mean? In the spirit on the Lord's day. What's the Lord's day? The Sabbath. Okay, so what day is that? Sunday. Sunday for right. us, yeah. All right, so it's Sunday, and he's in the spirit. What's he doing? He's praying. He's doing church. It's Sunday. <laughs> he's doing church. So he's on the beach. Maybe he's the only Christian there. I don't think so, but mm -hmm. he's doing what pastors do on Sunday. He's having church on the beach. Nice, even though it's a penal colony. So he is in the spirit. He is, he is praying. He is doing worship on the beach on Sunday. And all of a sudden, uh, he hears a loud voice behind him, like the sound of a trumpet, saying, you know, write in a book what you see. And he turns, and then he sees who's this voice, because he probably recognizes the voice, right? And he's like, that's Jesus. He turns around. Why doesn't it look like Jesus? So you have this picture now. First, he sees the seven golden lampstands and the, and the stars. But he saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to a feet, girdled across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, feet like mirror browns. I forgot to bring those books with the pictures in it, uh, which has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was shining like the sun. So... We've never seen Jesus look like that. Mm -mm. So where do we actually see that? And it's not just one place, but that's the, that's the image, maybe jogs your memory, of the Ancient of Days. I saw one like the Ancient of Days, the prophet, one of them says. Um, then the Ancient of Days looks like our vision of what God the Father looks like. Old man, white robe, mm -hmm. white hair, right? But now we're seeing that that's actually Jesus. So you can find those in Daniel 7, Daniel 10, Ezekiel 1, Proverbs 16, Matthew 17, Hebrews 4. So that gives you a description of the robe, the hair, the eyes, the feet, the voice, the mouth, that. That is actually Lewis Brighton. Hmm. That is Lewis Brighton is Dr. Brighton's son, who's also a PhD, but Dr. Brighton wrote the Concordia Commentary on Revelation. That is his son, who is also a PhD, that did that art. Hmm. There's a whole animated movie of the Book of Revelation that's done with like computer graphics, early computer graphics, <laughs> uh, that actually just shows, what it puts it in images for you of all mm -hmm. the stuff that's described. It's, I mean, it's not bad, but it's very dated now. Who's that? Is that John? That would be John. Okay. Because he is, in fact, an old man. Oh, there, there it is with John. Hmm. You want to taste it without anything? Anybody else want tea? No, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Do you like, like uh, sugar or plain? Uh, too sugar. Sure. It's amazing that you can just see, so I don't have a picture. You can just pull it out, you know? Think about the way we used to do school. Go to the library and have to look things up. 
Oh, it'd take forever because you got to uh, find it in the library. Yeah. I remember my mom bought a set of encyclopedias yeah. for us to have at home because... Us too. Yeah, and like something. now, like, throw those puppies out, uh, you know? They're outdated. Yeah. Probably collectors, I don't know. Half the things didn't even happen in history anymore. <laughs> right? There's a little island of patents right there. And don't talk about it because it might be offensive to someone. Somebody. It's yeah. like, how about we remember it so it doesn't happen again? I know. I know. Those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. Right, exactly. Yeah. Patents. Yep, I see it. A big map. Hmm. We've been there. We oh, have. Yeah. I bet they do. <laughs> oh, check out this one. This picture is cool. That picture. Oh, Thank that you. is pretty. Okay, so this is Revelation 22. Yellow tea. So this was a yellow tea put down to age in 2006, I think. Wow. That one's cool. Mm -hmm. that one, but that's not till 22. So was John, so we don't know if John was the only one there. Obviously he was. I mean, he, I don't know. I doubt he's the only Christian there because right. obviously this must be where they put Christians. Um, so did they see the same thing or not? It was just John. Don't know. Not, wasn't revealed to us. Yeah. So. Hmm. He may have been by himself because maybe he would have made mention, but. The visions were only given to him, so that's probably why he doesn't mention anybody else. So but there could have been other people there, and right. I'm like, what's John looking at? I know, right? right? So, hmm. yeah, so that whole image of uh, the, you know what I should do? Do I have that here? I do have that here. Hang on. <laughs> I am disorganized today, I'm sorry. I've never seen you like this. <laughs> it's weird. notes when I wrote the Bible say. So okay, so the big image that you want to look at is Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. We have the sash, which is a symbol of a king, right? And then showing someone that's like old even though, well, I mean, Christ is eternal, you know, but uh, the, I guess looking some, at someone with an old face, that's, you know, great age always signifies wisdom. Uh, God's all-knowingness and his, um, his omniscience is all-knowingness. Uh, his eyes were like a flame of fire, okay? That is his omnipresence. That's he's all-seeing, right? So you've got, you know, the, the white beard and hair, that signifies wisdom. He's all God is all knowing. The eyes like burnished bronze. These like fiery eyes, right? God's eyes, all seeing, symbolizes his all, all seeing, his omnipresence. He sees everything at once. He's, he is everywhere at once. Um, his feet like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and a strong voice like the voice of many waters, right? So if you hear a lot of rivers, like if you ever see like pictures of in the Amazon where a big river comes by and it has multiple waterfalls, or even mm -hmm. like Niagara Falls, that makes a lot of noise, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that that sound is, the sound and the feet like like bronze, that is strength, that's okay. omnipotence. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you have the sword, the two-edged sword, because Jesus being the good Lutheran pastor that he is, <laughs> rightly divides law and gospel, two sides of the word of God. And there's this great image, the image in the Luther Bible, the actual sword is coming through his head, the hilt is back here, and the mouth, the, the sword comes out of his mouth like a stone. It's weird looking, but it's hmm. cool. Um, it does say it's coming out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Some of the same comes from um, both sides of the, the same sword or something like that. Isn't there a saying that has 
I'm talking about both sides of the same sword. Like a double-edged sword? Kind of, Maybe. but not. <coughs> yeah, like uh, in is it Hebrews, the word of God is like a two-edged sword. And the two edges, I mean, we say law and gospel, but one side cuts down and then the other side raises up. Mm -hmm. So one side destroys and the other side saves. Uh, because you're killing your enemies, you're saving mm -hmm. who's not your enemies. Um, and then also look at the imagery of his the hair, hairs on his head were white like white wool, like snow, eyes like a flame of fire. Look at the, when you have a chance, look at the accounts of the transfiguration and look at how the, Jesus transfigured as described. And it's similar, similar to this. Besides, John was there. He remembers the transfiguration. He was present. Peter, James, and John. So he's going to see this, and he's going to remember that, so he's going to hearken back to, because he's got to put to words all this stuff he saw, so he's going to hearken back to the vision in Ezekiel, the vision in Daniel. He's going to think back to Jesus on the mountaintop. All of that stuff is going to uh, contribute. So the whole Son of Man thing, that's Daniel 7. Uh, the Golden Sash, that's Exodus 28. The... Uh, Son of Man again, Daniel 7. The uh, hair, Daniel 10. The eyes, like a flame of fire, is Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, there's a lot of eyes in Ezekiel chapter 1. It's bizarre. And then uh, the sword is Ephesians 6, 17, not Hebrews. Ephesians 6. Here. Why this is not in here, I don't know. This when I was just a wee vicar. That's what I used to do on Saturday mornings for Bible studies. Okay. Is there any significance? Good question. Is there any significance? So Jesus is standing, John turns around, he sees Jesus standing in the middle of the lampstands. Is there any significance to where Jesus is standing? He's in the middle of the churches. Right. So seven churches, and he's standing right in the middle of it. He's there. Uh, let's see. And isn't he holding the stars in his hand? Mm -hmm. Which are the pastors. Which are the so pastors. He's got them in his hand. Right. So he's, he's got me. He's got my back. Interesting. Good. Because. Yeah. yeah. All right, so those are our first numbers because numbers have meaning. So this number of seven, the number of perfection, that which only God can do, is going to do, or has done. And then the number three, which is the Holy Trinity. The number four is the number of the created world. So three plus four is seven. The created world and everything that's not created, which is what's left, God. So you put God's created world and himself together and you have perfection. And then the seven lampstands again are the churches. The stars are the angels of the seven churches, the pastors. So Luther didn't know what to make with, of this book at first. I mean, Luther, I mean, everybody had trouble with certain books of the Bible. So like when Luther did his turn of translating, you know, he got to Revelation, but I can't cite a source. I don't remember. I, I have to find it. It may have never been translated to English, which is why I can't find it. But at one time, Luther said that Revelation was the ravings of a madman. Because he's just like, what is this? It doesn't make any sense. Until he figured out it makes sense. And he's like, it's a pretty good book. But yeah, he said the same thing about the book of James. He's like, well, this maybe shouldn't be in the Bible. Because he didn't understand it. And then he understand, oh, it's not actually about works righteousness. So yeah, it's pretty good. We should keep it. Did that a little bit with Hebrews. I mean. So any questions about... Chapter 1. Do our stars have any significance? Our stars? With the stars that we see in the sky, does it have any, like, is there, like, a parallel or a... Um, I just wonder about that, because... No, I mean, every culture through the ages has had astrology. I mean, that's never gone away. <coughs> it's right. been around since day one. It's like, you know, those must mean something. I mean, ours, no, they don't. I mean, the stars in the sky in Jesus' day and our day were almost indistinguishable because they do move. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, 
for them to really start getting unrecognizable, you're talking, you know, like tens of thousands of years have to pass, mm -hmm. and then you'll notice the shapes don't make the shapes anymore. Okay. Uh, I just always wondered about that. But yeah. I mean, they're beautiful. I think it's... Yeah, and, and there was a book written, it was called The Gospel in the Starry Heavens. I've got a copy of it with all my old books at the other church in one of the books so it doesn't get mushed because it's just like a pamphlet almost. Mm -hmm. But it's called The Gospel in the Starry Heavens. And it talks, it tells you the story of salvation through the constellations mm -hmm. that this guy wrote a bazillion years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's like out of print and you can still find vintage copies of it once in a while. What's it called? Gospel it's called The Gospel in the Starry Heavens. I believe that's the one. And it's, you know, it's okay. It's, it, it's another way to learn the constellations, I guess. But, uh, but the, the, the author's trying to make it out. It's like, that's why God put the stars like that, it's to tell the story. It's like, well, then why didn't he tell us that? Were we supposed to just decide? Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a neat way to, to teach a kid or do something. Because every culture has their own constellations. It's so like, oh, we have Orion the Hunter and the Great Bear and... Yeah, the Chinese have they totally from culture. To, I didn't know they changed from culture. Yeah, they to culture. changed from culture to culture. In fact, with hmm. some of the planetarium programs, you can go in and tell it to use the images of the different cultures. So, it's like, I want to see, I want to learn Chinese constellations. I want to learn Japanese constellations. I, I want to learn that. American. Oh, wow. Yeah, I want to learn Native well, American constellations. The yeah. They're different too. They were occurred to me. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So every culture has different pictures. That's cool. Oh, yeah. but it's it's like, why would that be any different? Just like that is Romans. It. Yes, attributed gods to everything, and everybody but has. The Romans and something. the Greeks were very closely aligned. It kind of you can see where it flows, and like Romance languages flowed. I mean, they're very similar. Yeah, the in Romans past stole from culture the Greek to culture, gods. and I guess I just kind of assumed that with the constellations too. But that's but something that we've attributed to the stars. The stars are there. Yeah, yeah. We just said, "Oh, look, that looks like a Big Dipper. Oh, that looks like a, a lion." <laughs> and certain ones, it's like, how do they even come up with that? Yeah, and so we've adopted the constellations that came oh. out of Greece and Rome. Yeah. That's where they're. So yeah, I think it's actually the ancient Jews, too, the Chaldean shepherds. Yeah, they had nothing else to do, yeah, right? They had nothing else but look at the stars. <laughs> yeah. Look at the stars or look at sheep. Okay, hmm. chapter two, which we're not going to get through all the churches. Let's just do one church at a time. So before we start the seven churches, so every letter is dictated to John. From who? Who's still speaking? Which Father. Jesus. Yeah. Je or Jesus. Jesus. Right. So Jesus is speaking. He's dictating the letters to John. Okay. And we're going to have an image of Christ in each description of the churches. We're going to have a summary of what Jesus sees going on in the churches. The good and the bad. A call to repentance. And a promise of blessing and hope. So we'll start with, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds. That would be terrifying. To like Jesus stands there, I know your deeds. Yeah. Like, crap. <laughs> I'm not good. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and that you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you have found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To whom whoever comes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. What was their first, what does he mean they left their first love? Okay, so you have no way of getting all of this from, unless you've got like super thorough study Bible or someone teaches it to you. So it's just like, oh yeah, well you know that's actually like you're reading it out of the text. Oh yeah, you know all this stuff. No, you got to read the commentaries. People that have researched this. There's a fellow named Mounts, Dr. Mounts, wrote a commentary on Revelation. That's um, very good, actually. Dr. Brighton, who wrote our Lutheran commentary, constantly in the footnotes, it's like this name Mounts kept coming up. It's like I'm just going to buy Mounts's commentary, read the whole thing. 
and it's great for all background stuff. It's like, that's where people go. He did all the historical research, background, where was this church, all this stuff. So most of the stuff that I'm going to tell you about these seven churches comes from this Dr. Mounts fellow, which also, if you read our study notes, which Dr. Brighton wrote for the book of Revelation, since he wrote the commentary and it was published before the Lutheran Study Bible, a lot of that stuff's going to match because he got it right from Dr. Mounts because that's who he cites. So, since I don't do footnotes in my Bible studies, that this is where I got all this. Okay, so Ephesus. Ephesus is the city of change. It was a free city and it had great political importance. It was self-governed and it was an assize city. So what an assize or assize city was meant that they were an independent city, but regularly a Roman governor would come like kind of riding the circuit, like the old circuit riding judges. He would ride in and he would try cases and he would dispense justice for the empire. Uh, it had a major stadium. Okay, so it's a big city. You know, it's like a big city like New York, Chicago, Cleveland has a stadium, right? So it has a stadium. It must be a big city. It had a major marketplace and it had a major theater. And the theater was built on the west uh, slope of Mount Pion, which overlooked the harbor, uh, which seated about 25,000 people. So to get an idea of that, that would be half the size of the Colosseum. The Colosseum seated 50,000. Okay. okay. So then they built amphitheaters on the side of mountains because it's a natural dish. And then it has a natural focal point then because the whole amphitheater is, is, a, is a, like a satellite dish. So it has a focus. And so you can hear, that's why uh, opera singers aren't actually projects, making that much noise. The sound, yeah. it's, the, it's the room they're in. Yeah. Uh, so you can hear a pin drop all the way in the back. It's the acoustics. Like you could do that in Pompeii at the amphitheater. Someone could stand in the middle and you can go up at the top. And if somebody's whispering, you can hear every word they say. And they're just whispering. It's weird. Yeah. And, and natural stadiums are like that. Uh, yeah, so just random archaeology history. So the local deal, the local detail is that there are these false apostles and these Nicolaitans. Who are the Nicolaitans? I don't know much about who they are other than they were what we call antinomians. So anti means a guest, nomos means the law. They're anti-law, meaning anti-God's law. Okay. So that's something the early Lutherans got accused of. Also, so we go into a little detail about it in our confessions because like, we don't, we do not abolish the law. So what they say is, well, we're we're saved by grace through Christ. Therefore, it doesn't matter if we sin. So the law does not apply. No, it does not say that anywhere in the Bible. The law one hundred percent applies. The consequence of breaking the law does not apply. But we're still not. But the law still applies. You can't just like not. It's not all of a sudden okay to murder, okay? Just because your because your sins are going to be forgiven doesn't mean you can just go out and kill people. No, that's not no. The law still counts. So antinomianism is this against the law, uh, and yeah, no Christians don't do that, and they should hate it. People saying it's okay to do something despicable in the name of God—that's bad, right? You had that in the past, and it hasn't worked out so great, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I'm not talking about crusades. I'm talking about the crusades that never actually made it to the Holy Land. So they're supposed to go fight Muslim Turks. And instead, they just go sack Venice, which is a Christian city. They're like, okay, we're, yeah, we're not going all the way to the Holy Land. We're just going to, we're going to beat up the Venetians again and take their stuff. That's not a, that's sinful, right? The whole point of going to the Holy Land was def defended from Islam. But no, they were just out to plunder and, and rape and pillage. Bad. Very. One of the things that, one of the very first things it says in my study Bible is the Nicolaitans indulged in meat offered to pagan gods. Oh, good. Got the same note because I got the same Bible. It's, that's the same Bible. Um, right. So you remember when Paul uh, dealt with that Peter? Peter? Peter and Paul got into a bit of a tussle in Acts because they didn't see eye to eye on some stuff yet. And Paul had to come and tell Peter what for, because Peter was being Peter, right? Which is hard -headed. So the early Christians were going, hey, this meat that's being offered to pagan gods, 
Is it okay we eat that? Because we know that's not God. So who cares if we eat meat sacrifice? Because when you sacrifice the meat, it doesn't get just burned up. You, you actually had dinner. That's like when you had the uh, sacrifices in, in Judaism. That's what fed the priests. So some of it got burned up, but some of it, that was the portion. That's where the priests got their food for their families. Uh, and some sacrifices were, you know, well, so they're going, well, we could just go to the temple where they're having a sacrifice. It's like, hey, the Hell's Angels are having a barbecue. Everybody's invited. Okay, we could all go, but is that the best thing to do for Is that the best thing we should be doing? Kind of like you could doesn't mean you should. Yeah, because kind of you could doesn't mean you should. I mean, I kind of want to go just because I want to see what they do if I show up like this. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, is it okay for a Christian to eat meat sacrificed to pagan gods? Yeah, technically it's okay. But is it the right thing to do? Uh, no. But if they just like, oh, well, what, ha what, do you, what happens if you eat as a Christian? Everybody knows you're a Christian. So if you have a group of them, like the Nicolaitans, and they all go to the temple, and they all sit down and eat this meat sacrificed to Jupiter, whatever. What does that say about them? It looks like you agree with what It looks like Christians on. believe yeah. in Jupiter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we have this nice Latin phrase handed down to us from the lab, uh, from the Reformation. Lex orandi, lex credendi. So as we believe, so we pray. What that means is what you do reflects what you believe. So what we do in church reflects what we believe. Okay, we look at this and we pray. We believe in prayer. We turn around and we pronounce absolution we believe in the forgiveness of sins what we do in our faith life reflects what we actually believe now if you uh, don't believe it's the body and blood of christ you just give it to anybody and it doesn't have to be wine and you know it could be grape juice or it could be crackers there, there's been like pretzel and, and diet coke communion someplace i actually heard of that they, they do bizarre things when you don't believe it's the Lord's body and blood, you can do what you want because you can do what you want. So that reflects you don't really believe that's anything because you're treating it like it's nothing. Right. That's the idea of this, how you, can, how you pray reflects what you believe. So if we all go to you know, a pagan temple, the Druids invite us to their barbecue. There's a group of Druids in Madison. We go to the Druids for their fall picnic and we all sit around and eat with these guys as a church. Like, oh, Grace came and ate with the... That means that the Grace believes what the Druids believe. Mm -hmm. You can't help but make that conclusion. If two churches get together, you assume the two churches believe the same thing, or they shouldn't be together. right? If you pray to two different gods, you should not be worshiping together. Who are you praying to? Yeah. So that's why, no, it's probably not in the best interest for them to go as a group and eat at the temple this meat sacrificed to idols. And that's probably not the only thing they do, but that practice reflects that they probably believe that sinning is okay, that that doesn't matter what they do. Right? So since we know that they're antinomians. All right, so the bad thing, that they've left their first love. That's the bad thing that we see. Um, don't remember what the first love is. Can't remember. That's embarrassing. Maybe we don't know, and that's why I don't have it written down anywhere. That might be so. There are some things in Revelation we just don't know. So. He says here, and the same we have the same thing. Was your saying? The Lord warned against brotherly love growing cold in the chaos of the end of times. Ooh. John's letters show a similar concern for Jesus. Jesus' command to love one another as He has loved us. Where have you got that? I got the same Bible you do. What note are you reading? 2-4. Two, 2-4. Four. Two, four. The love. Oh, okay. You, you had the same? You're oh, I'm looking right at it. How about Wasn't that? that his very first original commandment? Love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be... Love the Lord thy God with all thy strength, with other, all your heart, with all your mind, and your neighbor and yourself. The very first anything was okay. love. So they left their first love. But we don't know We don't know a specific... So the, the your first love is supposed to be God, right? Mm -hmm. So they're getting... Maybe getting a little sketchy with their faith. Uh, and then their call to repentance is repent 
and also do good works. Not that the good works save them, but that they do those things because it's what they're supposed to be doing. All right, repent and do the deeds you did at first. So do the good things you used to do. Maybe they're getting lazy. Maybe this, even though they hate the Nicolaitans, it's rubbing off on them a little bit. That like you can slack off. Out they shouldn't have been hanging out mm-hmm. with them, right? That's why you have close communion. That's why you have close communion. <laughs> All right, so they're like they called, re- called repentance. Let's go back to your first love. Get back to the basics, which we do. You know, that's why we repeat everything every church year. Because every church year, we're going to hear that, you know, re- work for your neighbor, receive receive your neighbor as you would a child, mm-hmm. right? Get back to basics. We need the reminders. Because we need to hear it over and over and over again. Same. How many times are you going to read that book? As many times as it takes to stick, which is forever. Because it's never going to stick. Kind of like this today's society, though, too, as we're moving further and further away from Christ and just helping each other. You know, we're, we've we had this society now that you know everything is okay. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that you know maybe you identify as something different now that's okay because it's all about love, right? It's it's all about love, and it's so we're we're becoming of the world, I guess. Or in the world. You know, we're becoming... Yeah, and we're supposed to be in the world, but not of it. Right, And that's what exactly. it is, is we're, we're in it, and we're of it. Right. You know, and that's why you're like, why did Jesus preach against, preach against worldliness so much? Because that wasn't the most worldly world back then. But then, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, you had some pretty sophisticated cities. Right. You know, they had feasts that were just like, I don't know how much those dinner costs, but I can't afford to eat like that. Mm-hmm. You know, all, uh, that, all that stuff happened back then. It just it yeah. was more hidden back then. Yeah, and and the same today. As you know, we're we're worldly. We, like I said this morning, is we've been so brainwashed to it that we don't even realize that maybe there's a better way than this mm-hmm. to, to live the way we're living. Um, it's not necessarily what the text was talking about, but we have so much influence. It's like, hey, you know, when it's all about community and your neighbor, which is anybody who's not you. Um, that's a whole lot different than it's all me, 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 me mm-hmm. all the time. Although I love it when it's all about me because I'm awesome. You know? Yeah. And, you know, we don't like hearing it. We hear it, it's like, yeah, okay, yeah. I love my neighbor while I'm here at church. <laughs> and then it's going to be about me as soon as I get my car. Crank the music. Me. Mm-hmm. See, that's just it because we're in church an hour a week. And we have the rest of the world every other second of the day. Yeah. And, yeah. and they're louder than we are. People aren't, you know, when they took God yeah. out of schools and families weren't sitting down to dinner and saying grace and going to Sunday school. I mean, mm-hmm. we have really been numb to think that that way of life is okay. Yeah, and you know, when you pray before a meal, then ask yourself this. It's like, well, I'm pretty good about that. I'm not very good about that. But I'm pretty good about that. When's the last time you returned thanks after the meal? You're supposed to do that too. <laughs> you don't do it. <laughs> See? We forgot, we forgot our first love. We forgot some of those things we were taught. I mean, we were taught to do that when we were kids. I don't... What were we taught to do? Return, I was taught return thanks after the meal. There's an after the meal prayer too. Yeah, we which I don't, ever Which I don't have memorized yeah. anymore because. I haven't thought about that in 40 years. Yeah. And it's like, oh yeah, that was a thing. <laughs> that was wow. a thing. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. All right, so return your first love. Hmm. So that's our the call to repentance. Or if you don't repent, what's the what's going to happen? I'm going to remove your lampstand. Yeah. That's the church. So I'm just going to take your church and it's going to go. Hmm. But what happens to a church when it's faithless? It's well, it gets huge. It gets like 900 people every week. <laughs> right. Kidding. With their mm-hmm. coffee bars. With their coffee bars. Yeah. Right. But, uh, no, but if... if uh, well, what's he saying? If you're not going to do church right, you don't deserve a church? No, it's if you're not going to repent. If he says, well, if I, you don't repent. If you don't repent, then I'm going to take your church away. Hmm. Which if you're unrepentant, <clears throat> would you notice or care? You probably wouldn't. You probably not. Even worse. But it's a warning to us, too. Right? So I remember I said, think about which one of the seven churches we are. They all repeat throughout history. Yeah, they do. So the promise, I will grant you to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. Pretty good promise. Eternal life. Which is already there. So he's basically saying, don't fall away. Excuse me. Don't 
succumb to apostasy, don't leave the faith, the unforgivable sin against the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about. So if I'm going to take away the church and you're not going to be able to eat of the tree of life, which you're baptized, you're in the church now, you already have that promise. So what you're saying is don't leave. Don't let the world make you abandon your faith. Right. So that's what that one's about. It gets, and they're trying harder and harder and harder. You know? Oh, yeah. the, like, pers the persecution's coming. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's already begun. Not here so much, but it's coming. It's happening in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, it's that far away from us. Yeah, it probably is not. And guess what? They got a rude awakening coming because the church grows in times of persecution. In fact, it's the only time it grows. <laughs> Otherwise, it shrinks. But when the church is persecuted, the church grows. Hmm. It's illogical. It's counterintuitive, but that's what happens throughout history. It's funny, you know. It's funny you say that because, like, you hear different stuff about persecution and stuff, and then we'll, I'll turn around and I'll see something else where, you know, Christian faith or Christian whatever, something out here, or you're, you'll see it right in the open. Or we went to um, Brittany's oh, thing. Her white coat ceremony. Their white coat ceremony. It was very, it was because she's good to be a doctor. Oh. And okay. their whole presentation, they did the um, Pledge of Allegiance. And then they had, they had, there was a bunch it's of other stuff, but it was all Christian. In public? <laughs> then yeah. they, oh, had wow. a, they had a video presentation, which was very patriotic, but it also showed people kneeling and praying yeah. and stuff. And we were we're like, like, we were sitting here going, Great whoa, yeah, that's cool. They'll yeah. come for you after they come for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So just like you're saying. That's cool. On one hand, you'll That's encouraging. People. Yeah, it was. Exactly. It was I, I kind of had tears in my eyes as that's we were neat. watching that video yeah. there. And it was like, wow. Huh. Mm -hmm. So it. It's there. You know, one hand you'll hear persecution, another hand I'll, I'll hear something, two or three. So I'm, I'm like, okay, this isn't so bad, but I mean, we always have to keep vigilant. Constant vigilance. Yeah. All right. So, verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right, the first and the last who is dead and has come to life, says this I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Ah, the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. That's a weird one. All right, notice how each one of these ends. Let, let those who... Let, let him who hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. Each one of these letters, they're going to go to that church, but then that church is going to send them to all the others. That's how this works. Spread the word. Okay, so Smyrna, the city of life. It is the only one of the seven cities that is still in existence in the same place. It's, mm -hmm. only, it's only one of these seven cities that's still there. Uh, you can find them on a map, but they're not. We're in the same place, they get reestablished. But this is Smyrna is modern day Ismar. Is Ismar? Esmer? I don't know if I'm saying it right. I think it's Ismar, uh, Turkey. 35 miles north of Ephesus on the east shore of the Aegean Sea. Oh, is that where they make Smyrna? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's where the good figs come from, say actually. Uh, huh. Greek vodka. Could you imagine? Yeah. Ooh. Okay, they have an excellent harbor. And the neat thing about this harbor is that it is narrow enough that you can close the harbor and fortify it. Oh. So you can, you can do it like, oh, they're coming to invade us by sea. No, they're not, because we're going to shut the sea off. <laughs> we're boom, wow. Up goes the wall. All right. Uh, it was an important, it had an important trade road passing through it uh, from which the produce of the Valley of Hermas uh, moved, which is a very, very fertile valley. valley. It also boasted a famous stadium, a library, and the largest public theater in all of Asia. And tradition says it is the birthplace of Homer, like from the Iliad and the Odyssey, that Homer. The tradition said that is where he was born. I'm sorry, that's Greece, Ismar, Greece. Or is that modern day Turkey? It was Greece back then, it's Turkey today, yeah. Uh, coins, inscriptions on coins, describe it as the first of Asia in beauty and size. It was allied closely with Rome, 
and therefore the emperor cults. So those cults we talked about where uh, emperor worship was rampant, uh, they're close, closely allied with Rome. And then the Acropolis, and Acropolis is the core fortification of the city. Uh, so the Acropolis on Mount Pages, which is now called Mount Catificali, 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 um, which is the name of the hill located within the actual city limits of Izmir, Turkey today. And that Acropolis, that fortification, was called the Crown of Smyrna. And so that's a little description of the area. So the local, de local detail there is the synagogue of Satan is there. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so what is the synagogue of Satan? Evil Jews. The synagogue of Satan, those are the Judaizers, Jude, try again, the Ju, Judaizers of Christianity. So who are the Judaizers? They are the circumcision party. You'll hear it described in some of the epistles somewhere. It's called actually called the circumcision party. So what they were were, oh, hey, it's okay to believe in Jesus. That's good. We're Christians, but you have to keep all the uh, ceremonial laws of the Jews still, because we're Jews, and Jesus was Jew. But now we believe Jesus is God, but we're still Jews, we still have to do all this stuff. And uh, no, you do not have to keep all the Jewish laws, especially circumcision. So yes, you have to keep the Christian faith, but you still have to do all the ceremonial nonsense, which Jesus made very clear, that is gone. And then Paul and Peter will hash ahead, hashed it out also, uh, that no, Peter had his dream, you know, Peter, rise and eat, kill and eat. Don't call unclean what God has made clean. And then Paul lets them have it about it. Uh, and then they go, yeah, you're right. We don't have to do that stuff. We are free. Okay, so that is what the synagogue of Satan is, is these people are bruising people's consciences because what are you going to do with all these Greek converts that don't know the first thing about all that stuff? It's like, okay, so i got to have how many tassels on my robe? I mean... That's a lot of details if you're not raised in it. It's a lot of details if you are raised in it. Mm -hmm. So they're convicting the consciences of all these new converts going, oh yeah, that's all good, but first you got to go get your schmeckle clipped and then you have to do all this other stuff too. And they're going to go, uh, what? <laughs> you, what? No, right? These are all things of men. Right. And no. <laughs> As an adult, no. As, mm -hmm. Ow. No, no, no. So the image of Christ that we receive is the image of Christ, the first and the last, the one who was dead and came back to life. The image we are going to see a lot in Revelation, the one who was slain yet is still alive. The call for repentance, stop being afraid. If that's the only thing they got going for them, they're not doing, going against them, that's not too bad. But stop being afraid of the coming suffering. It will be temporary. Now be faithful to death, and I promise you, you will receive the crown of life. So they will not be hurt by the second death. What's the first death? If death is the second death, what's the first death? The death of your old self. Yeah, so when's that? When you receive faith, when the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. gives you faith. And when does that happen to us, usually? Usually baptism. Baptism, mm -hmm. there you go. So that's the first death, when you are drowned, when your old Adam is drowned. Uh, though you know he's drowned, he's still kicking. <laughs> Yep, so you will not be hurt by that second death. Be faithful to death. Even Don't be afraid of persecution even if it kills you. Because, <laughs> so what? <laughs> you have eternity and you have, you know, eternity. That's all right. Okay, the third one. Then we, should we stop them after the third one? What is it talking about they're going to be thrown into prison? Uh, I think literally prison. Okay. Yeah. Like literally, literally prison. Um, because they're Christian? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's where John is right now. Right. Okay. Oh, that's where I never did finish. So John, so Revelation probably written near the end of the first century, so like right around the year, like 99, 100 uh, AD. Um, yeah, and that the reason for their persecution, the reason, you know, it's important to know that this was a city where those emperor cults were prevalent. If you don't go worship in the emperor cult, hey, we're going down to you know Augustus's temple. You want to come with? No. It's like they don't go to Augustus. They won't pray to Augustus, Caesar Augustus. 
hmm, what's wrong with them? So that's where the persecution is coming from. They won't bow down to Caesar. Right? So they're not bowing down to Caesar as God. I think at some point they start calling themselves God while they're still alive too. Uh, but since they will not bend the knee to Rome as being God, government's okay, but God, no. Uh, that's where the persecution's coming from. Okay. Right. You know, so if we have to start like bending the knee to the governor or the president, you know, so if you don't bend the knee, you know, because I'm God, really? <laughs> I guess, yeah, really? I mean, none of them have been that egotistical. So go, oh, I just passed a law in Congress, I'm God. Could you imagine that I would have today? a hard time seeing that happen as we are today. I, I mean, there would be too many people go. I would just oh, go, God, he's, no. he's right. kidding, right? Because this is a joke. Because that would be epically funny. But <laughs> I mean, even the idiots we have on both sides of the aisles, like none of them are like, think, oh, this is actually going to work. <laughs> I'm going to pass a law that I'm God. Right. All right, so Pergamum. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell. I know where you live. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Hmm. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwelt. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. I shouldn't have started this one this week. This is a hard one. This one's weird. <laughs> They're all weird to one degree or another. This one's really bizarre. Okay, so Pergamum is, uh, represents worldliness, okay, because they are the city of authority, the capital city of Asia Minor. Right? They're built on a cone-shaped hill, a thousand feet high, that dominates the Caicos Valley, that's been inhabited since prehistoric times. Okay, So the very first people have lived in this area. They have a library. They had a library that had over 200,000 volumes in it. That's huge. Um, yeah, the... the the Library of Alexandria was destroyed in 20, 30 BC, 20 BC, around that time. It's Anthony and Cleopatra's fault. Uh, yeah, so 200,000 volumes is a big library. Yeah. Okay. Uh, legend says that parchment was invented there. All right, so parchment is animal skin. So you skin a sheep or a goat or a cow, but usually sheep. Uh, you skin it. You stretch it, cure it, and then you put stuff that's like basically uh, like a whiting or a, a powder to make it so that ink will stick to it. You have to put a sizing on it so it's like a glue size, probably rapid glue, or actually it'll be uh, cow glue. Not fish. Or might be fish glue, uh, but they'll use some kind of gelatin uh, animal product plus the chalk to make the surface whitish. Uh, so that ink will stick to it. Hmm. So that's what uh, parchment is. So obviously it's expensive. It's still expensive. You can still buy parchment. And it's really expensive. It's like 10 bucks for an 8 by 10 piece uh, that you can write on both sides. Because uh, you can only get so many for one animal. Like if you do a folio size book, like a Bible size book like that, you're going to get maybe two pages per animal, probably only one. So wow. every page, animal has to die <laughs> to make that page because it's a big page. Uh, so you can get a couple. You get a couple per animal. So books are expensive if they're written on parchment, but stuff lasts forever as long as you don't get it wet. And labor intensive. And labor intensive. Mm, geez. The, the scribes were expensive, but the actual ink wasn't that's all homemade and then you know uh, uh, papyrus wasn't that expensive 
it was a little labor intensive to what make. What was the ink? Just like natural pigments? It was uh, usually iron uh, iron gall ink. So you go out on your like oak tree, you know, you'll you'll see galls, oak galls. Those like the the, the tree gets does pimple or a boil. Okay. It's caused by a, a, a insect larva, and it causes a swelling. And you lop one of those off, and the juice that's inside it is gall. It's mm -hmm. called gall, and you use that. Uh, mix that with iron oxides, which are like red earths, whatever. Um, and you mix that together, and that makes your ink. And then you have to have a binder, which is usually gum arabic or some kind of gum. You swizzle all that together, and then you write with it. Yeah. And the neat thing about anything based on iron is it lasts practically forever because it's metal. <laughs> yeah. So that stuff lasts a pretty long time. Yeah, all ink was made out of natural stuff. And then uh, they started using soot getting toward the Middle Ages. That's when you start getting to like lamp black, it was called, which is just soot from candles. You take that soot, which is almost pure carbon, you mix it with a binder again, and you have black ink. Uh, and that's what all the Asian inks that you see, like all their calligraphy, that real rich black they have, or they do a painting with an ink painting called Sumi. Sumi, they do that with that ink too. And their ink is in sticks. Well, the ink is soot mixed with binder into, and they make mold it into a stick, and then you rub it on a grinding stone with water to reconstitute it in the ink. It's really, really rich. You so yeah, it's a little. I just got my geek. Oh my goodness! Uh, it's one. Of, it's because I studied like the ancient manuscript stuff, like how how are books written, book nerd. So I've studied like how writing came to be, how books came to be, what they used. I what remember the it. Yeah, like my favorite book is called The Archaeology of Medieval Bookbinding. It's fascinating reading. I don't know, why, and nobody wants to borrow it from me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it shows you like all the different how the bindings were made, how they sewed everything. I think that's cool. So. Mm. Because the books we make there are cheap. Mm, true. Mass production. Yes, mass production. <laughs> okay, so legend had it that parchment was made here. The most spectacular part of this city was the upper citadel where there were pagan temples. And there was a frieze around the main altar. You know, frieze is that sculpture that wraps around. Uh, it was an altar to Zeus, depicting all the various Greek gods uh, in victorious combat over all of the giants of the earth, which symbolized, was a symbol of the civilization. It symbolized the triumph of civilization over barbarism. Okay, so you think this people have been inhabiting this place since there have been people, and so they've seen the entire progression of mankind toward uh, like a Tower of Babel kind of thing. Uh, so the people of Pergamon's greatest pride was being the official center of Asia for the emperor cult. So they have all this stuff, and their big claim to think what they loved about themselves the most is, oh, we worship the emperor, and we're the place you go. That was their big thing. This is what we love being known for. So the local detail is Satan's throne is there. Satan lives there. Because what is, we'll talk about Antichrist later in the book, but what is Antichrist against Christ? So what's more against Christ than having the center of emperor worship? So that is Satan's throne. That's the, that is the Antichrist. One of them. All right, so Saint Antipas is this Antipas they're talking about. All right, so Saint Antipas, because he was martyred, he was the bishop of Pergamum, and that's where he was martyred. So that's when he talks about uh, you did not deny my faith even the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you. That's who they're talking about. So St. Antipas was the bishop of Pergamum, and they killed him, and they're like, hey, they killed our bishop, and we're not going to let that stop us. We're going to keep worshiping. So they did not abandon, uh, abandon the church, even though that happened. The teaching of the Nicolaitans are there, so we have more antinomianism it's everywhere. Right, so the image of Christ we see is the image of Christ with the two-edged sword. So what Christ sees is, the good thing is, they hold on to my name. They didn't deny the faith even when Antipas was martyred. But the bad things are some are holding to the teachings of Balaam. And the teachings of Balaam are syncretism, idolatry, and sexual immorality. So idolatry, we understand. Sexual immorality, we understand. So what is syncretism? Okay, syncretism means togetherism. So uh, syncretism is if a Jew 
a imam, you know, rabbi and imam and a pastor get up on a stage together and pray together. That syncretism, that's not good <laughs> because what God are they praying to? Because they would say, if they're not a Lutheran pastor or conservative Christian pastor, the Christian pastor, the rabbi, and the imam would all say, we're praying to the same God. No, they're not. <laughs> Okay. So that happens. That even happens now in our yes. culture. Like yeah, think it, about like very much. Presidential, you know, the inauguration. They have different religions come up and they all pray together. Yeah, and that's why if I ever do that, I will not be a pastor very long. They will come and get me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they will go. You can't do that. Except when people do it, they just, and the guy still they, he doesn't get disciplined at all, mm -hmm. uh, which is also bad. Uh, but yeah, so if you get up there and you pray with an imam and you pray with a rabbi and you pray with a so-called Christian pastor, what God are you praying to? Because the, the Jew is not praying to the same God we are mm -hmm. because they're still waiting for the Messiah to come. So they're not praying. I mean, the, the Jews had the triune God. They understood the second person of the Trinity. They understood the Holy Spirit. It's in the Old Testament. It's throughout the Old Testament. They understood the Trinity. They just kind of missed the fact that, you know, the Messiah came and the Messiah went and you missed the boat. So, yeah, they're te preaching to the God of the Old Testament, but that's not God anymore. That's not, you're not praying the same God. I mean, they technically are, but they're doing it wrong. But no, they, technically, they're not praying the same God. And the, the Muslims, no, they're not praying the same God. They don't believe in the Trinity. They get, they're mad at us for the thing. That's why they call us people of the book. And they said one of our errors that we need to correct is this whole Trinity nonsense. Uh, because Jesus wasn't God, because... He wasn't God. He was a prophet and he wasn't crucified because God wouldn't treat a prophet like that. It was a substitutionary thing. And the other person in the Trinity I think we worship is Mary. Can't imagine where they got that idea. Right? From the Roman Catholics. Mm -hmm. So they don't even know what the Holy Spirit is. Uh, so no, they do not pray to the same God we do. But when you all get up there at the same time, well, they must pray to the same God. They're doing it together. Isn't that nice? No, no it's not. That's bad. That's syncretism. It's going on back then. So that's when you are rubbing elbows with all the pagans. And you're like, we can, you know, let's have a potluck together. Okay, and it goes from potluck to, why don't you guys come over having the Lord's Supper? <laughs> Bad, don't do that. No, no. All right, idolatry, which the whole emperor thing is like, well, you know, we're going to go bend the knee to the emperor, but then we're going to go to church. No, you can't have... Two gods, right? So that's the bad things that Jesus has. Plus, these people that think the uh, that think that the uh, uh, Nicolaitans are good, All right? Call to repentance, repent, or I will go to war with the sword of my mouth. And you don't want that because one that one side, both sides cut. The one side cuts and brings you down. The other side cuts and brings you up. Right? And then the promise: I will give the hidden manna and a white stone. And a secret name. And why don't I have notes on this in there? I know I do. Really? Wow. Okay. So that's the weird part. Was what's the hidden mana? What's the white stone? And all that. Okay. So the hidden mana. You have to look at John 6. Which is about the Lord's Supper. And it's not about the Lord's Supper. But it's about the Lord's Supper. Um, so John 6, remember that's the whole, Jesus is talking about the bread of life for a long time. That's a really long chapter. So the hidden manna, John 6. one here but I don't I don't know how good this is it says the hidden man is the help you get when you pray for it in those times okay and that the white stone 
is the equivalence of innocence. If you were tried for a crime, a white stone signified acquittal and a black stone signified guilt. That is true. That is true. That was like that in the ancient world. Uh, it was also how they drew lots. Like there might be one black stone and all the rest of them are white. But that was different. Or maybe all of them were black and one was white. But that was for that was for like casting lots. In the study Bible, it says that the um, white stone special pebbles were sometimes used as admission tickets to banquets. Yes, that is also true. To banquets. banquets. So sort it's of almost like, like an admission thing in, to heaven, almost. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So right. Ticket to heaven. Like if your name wasn't on it, you weren't getting in, kind of thing. Yeah. That's right. Well, yeah. The, the hidden manna. Yeah. You know that's. Yeah, manna is food. You know, that was the bread that they received in the wilderness after they complained they didn't have anything to eat, and then they complained about the manna. Uh, so the, the hidden manna is... I don't know, I've probably gotten in trouble every time I've taught this because there's manna in the Ark of the Covenant, which was hidden. Nobody ever saw it again. Um, which goes back to what you were talking about. That's the, the help for which you pray. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. That's as good as any. In the study part of mine, it says hidden manna suggests a spiritual nourishment that the faithful believers <coughs> received as the Israelites traveled towards the promised land. God provided manna from heaven mm -hmm. for their physical nourishment. Jesus, as the, as the bread of life, provides spiritual nourishment that satisfies our deepest hungers. Yeah, and also Jewish tradition held that when the Messiah appears, he will bring manna again. Just like, interestingly enough, it was the Messiah that brought him the manna in the first place. Or the second person of the Trinity. Are they saying literal manna? Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, they have a tradition that manna would be given to the faithful again at the Messiah's appearance, which he did. He fed the 5,000, then he fed the 4,000, and then he said, you know, this is my body, take and eat. Uh, so again, you missed it. But, but yeah, that's the hidden manna that this also is that uh, tradition said that the, the Messiah will give the manna again. Well, he did. They missed it. <laughs> right? And then the white stone, yes, the, uh, the admission ticket. That will give you a white stone. Does, does the name on the stone? I think it does say that. Right? The name is on the stone where... Oh, a new name. I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone. Yes, so the name's written. So the hidden name, uh, what's the hidden name? That one's actually not that hard. You've already received that name. Got written on your forehead and on your heart. Again, baptism. Right, so that's when the name was first put on you. So I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's when the name was placed on you. Uh, I was hoping for Alexandra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's your name? Trinity. Trinity. Good. Right. Good. <laughs> yeah. So the when the name was placed on you, that's the name, the new name. The new name is Christ. Because that's how it works. It's when the Father looks at me, he don't see me, thank God. He sees Jesus. He doesn't see me. Thank God. Yeah. Because who'd want to look at me? He looks at you, he doesn't see you, he sees Jesus. He looks at you, he doesn't see you, he sees Jesus. That's awesome. Because <laughs> God the Father loves his son. He's not too happy with us. Okay. That was, which one, where am I on? Do, 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 yeah, theater chair, all right, yep. so. Start with the theater chair. Next time. Start with next time. No, theater chair. Theater chair. That, we start actually getting to know more facts about them and about the things that, that Jesus sees that are good and bad. Uh, so that gets better lead. So yeah, that was that was the last really weird one. But yeah, that's the secret name. It's not that big a secret. Okay, that is where we will end. And then we'll do, we'll do the rest of the next one.